let's answer some questions. Hi, your friends, what's going on? If you're new here, my name is Lakshma. I'm a board certified internal medicine physician and currently a cardiology fellow. And today you have caught me on a 28 hour shift where I am going to be using some of that time that I have relaxed, fingers crossed, for a little bit longer to answer some of your questions about what it's like to be just a cardiologist. Now, a few weeks ago, I asked you guys on Instagram, on YouTube, through the emails to say, let me know what questions you have about my life as a cardiology fellow, life as a cardiologist. I'm gonna do my best to answer them. So that's exactly what we're gonna do as I'm trying to enjoy some dinner. These are some French fries, some caffeine on a 28 hour shift here in the cardiology ICU, which I'll get into in a second. And to make this episode a little bit more interesting and a little bit more just free form, I really enjoyed the video that I made for you guys about my updates for 2024, where I felt like I could just answer questions off the cuff and talk in a little bit of detail without really worrying about what the YouTube algorithm had in store, whether the video is gonna do well or not. So I feel like that's where I come up with my best answers. And so now I'm ready to get into answering some of your questions. If you just wanna go ahead and look down below the description and the bookmarks, you'll be able to see all the questions that I answer during this episode. So if you're interested in one particular one or a few of them, feel free to jump around the video. And if you do, just make sure you hit that like and subscribe button if any of those answers are helpful to you. So let's now talk about today's call day before we get into the questions. Now, as a cardiology fellow, at least in my program, you take call once a week. That means that you are in charge, at least here, of the cardiology ICU. You wanna make sure that there's always cardiologists covering the ICUs. And for us, the fellows cover six out of the seven days. And when we cover, that means we are responsible for those patients overnight. Now, an ICU is not something that you would want your cardiologist not to be close by in. Ideally, you would want them to be in-house. And so we do what's called in-house call. That means that once a week, I am in the hospital, both throughout the day for whatever rotation I'm on, as well as during the night, just managing those patients in the ICU, and then I go home the next morning. So currently my normal rotation during the day is actually being the ICU fellow during the month of December and January as of recording this video. And today is Sunday, which is my call day. That means I came to work this morning at seven o'clock. I am going to stay until the rest of the night until the morning. And the only difference is, is that no one really relieves me because I'm the ICU fellow. So I'll see all the patients again tomorrow, write all their notes, staff them with my attending, make sure we have plans and then go home, ideally by 11, sometimes a little bit later, but usually the rule is you try to stay for no more than 28 hours and ideally try to get some sleep. This is the call room. As you guys can see, there's actually a bed behind me, which hopefully I get to enjoy at some point tonight. So currently it's 6 p.m. And by this time I have seen all the patients, both to myself, my attending, and third time just by myself. I've done certain procedures on patients who are a little bit sicker and may need things like lines. And I already am aware of one patient who is coming from a different hospital and transferring to ours. We're a transfer hospital. That means a lot of sick patients coming from other hospitals who may not have all the capabilities that we may have here will come and bring their sicker patients. And so that person is somebody I'm expecting later tonight. But right now, things are okay. Fingers crossed. So I'm going to try to enjoy my dinner and we'll get into your questions. So if you guys enjoy these styles of videos that are very laid back and hopefully come with a lot of nuggets, make sure you hit that like and subscribe to make sure that these kinds of videos come out to more people who may be interested interested in cardiology, medicine, all the things that we talked about here at the MD Journey. So starting with our first question, which is coming from Instagram asking, will you have a good lifestyle as a cardiologist? Now, this is big spectrum. My life as a hospitalist, which I did for one year, in case you're not familiar with my story, I went into residency. I knew where I wanted to match into fellowship. And so I chose to become a hospitalist at that hospital where the fellowship was taking place, which happens to be where I'm doing my fellowship right now. So it worked out because my wife and I wanted to stay near where the rest of our parents and be close to family as we were expecting our first little girl who is now about to be six months old. Long story short, being a hospitalist comes with an amazing lifestyle because you work seven days in a row. You have an entire week off and you do that an entire year. So you work 26 weeks out of the 52. It's a pretty good life. As a cardiologist, I likely will be busier and working more hours because there's no seven on seven off really as a cardiologist. And there's not often just five days a week. Sometimes you'll have to work weekends, but a lot of it will depend on the type of cardiology I choose to to, to choose and do, but also the group that I work for. So just how I take call right now as a cardiology fellow, I'm likely going to have to take some form of call as an attending independent provider, because when you're working with a group, you want to make sure if there's questions from any of their patients, somebody is there to be able to answer questions. If you are working in a group that works in a hospital, you want to make sure that there is somebody from that group assigned to cover those patients if need be. That's so going to be very dependent on the group that I work with of what my call schedule will look like. Usually it's not in-house call, so I'm not going to have to stay in the hospital like I am right now as a fellow, but maybe Maybe I am going to be covering a lot of services or more than one hospital or doing call more frequently. I don't know. And so that's going to determine a lot of what my lifestyle will look like. And the other aspect of this is that your lifestyle likely will become easier or better as you get further into your training because maybe you commit to not doing as much call, you may get paid less, but you have made yourself an asset otherwise to the group that you're joining in and thus you get benefited from not having to do as much call. Again, a lot of this will depend on the employer I ultimately work for, which right now I am just a first year fellow. 
six months in. And so I have a lot of time before I even get down there. And so while that's a great question, right now the answer is I just simply don't know just because I'm way too early into the journey to know what kind of employer I'm gonna be working for and what their call schedule looks like. I think my lifestyle is definitely gonna be busier than it was when I was a hospitalist, but I think I'm gonna be, or I know, I know I'm gonna be happier as a full-time cardiologist than I am as a medicine doctor. I'm gonna make a completely different video about that and I have actually about the pros and cons of being a hospitalist in case you guys are interested, I'll link that down below. So our next question is, what is the difference between a structural cardiologist and an interventionalist? It's a great question. And to be frankly honest, for the longest time, including when I was in residency, I didn't really know what that meant. So an interventionalist is kind of what it sounds like. It is a doctor who does interventions and the easiest one in description is think about the doctors who play stents. If you have a heart attack, you come into the hospital, you have a blockage and you need somebody to go in there and open up your pipes, open up your coronary arteries, you put a stent in, that's done by an interventionalist. A structural cardiologist is typically the way that is described. is an interventionalist who can do everything we just talked about, but they have decided to make their field of cardiology specialized in doing things like putting in a prosthetic valve. So patients who have an aortic valve disease, aortic valve is the last thing, essentially the last door between your left ventricle and the blood flow leaving to the rest of your body. And a lot of patients, especially when you get older, that valve gets really tight and it can cause a lot of symptoms and it can actually increase your chances of having very big complications like passing out chest pain and just increasing your chances of things like death. And so for those patients who have a really tight valve, we actually recommend replacing them. As you can imagine, as you get older, you're not the best candidate for surgery. So a structural interventionalist can actually go and do something like your groin and essentially take a catheter and place them and replace your bad catheter by something called a tapper. That is just one of the many procedures that a structural cardiologist can do. And so usually the description of structural cardiologist is given to somebody who is an interventionalist. There are people who are non-invasive structural cardiologists. These are people who specialize in not necessarily doing the procedure, but may have a lot of expertise in providing information like doing the trans esophageal echo and being able to get you information on how big is the valve? What does the rest of the anatomy of the body and the heart look like? Is the valve as bad as everyone thinks it is? And so there could be a wide spectrum of what you can be called when you talk about being a structural cardiologist. But usually when I think of it, I think of it as an interventionalist who typically will do procedures around things like valve repairs. But a big takeaway is that a structural cardiologist is often interventionalist. Not all interventionalists do structural cardiology. So our next question is, what are the things that a cardiologist can do that an internal medicine doctor can't? This one's actually perfect up my alley because I worked as a year as an internal medicine hospitalist, as I talked about, and there's a lot. There's a lot of overlap for sure. First, we can talk about some of the similarities. There are a lot of diseases that is, if you're a good internal medicine doctor, you will see in the field of cardiology that you should feel comfortable taking care of. And I know that when I was in an internal medicine hospitalist, I would get excited of taking care of these patients and often would not call the cardiologist unless there was something that they were sick enough or I needed help or they needed follow up that it made sense to just get the cardiologist to see them there so they could continue to follow the patient when they got discharged. But if you have patients who come in with heart failure and they have fluid overload, heart failure basically means you have a bad pump. Your heart doesn't squeeze as well, fluid doesn't move as well, fluid being blood. And so it starts to back up in places like your lungs, your liver, have lots of problems. People can feel terrible. Plus blood's going not going forward. So people are just not getting blood flow to their brains and all the other organs that are important. So you can think about all the complications that come from that. It's a really easy disease to manage when it's straightforward. You just take the fluid away, you make them peak. As a medicine doctor, you can do that. A cardiologist can do that. A medicine doctor can do that. Another example, you can have patients come in with weird rhythms. For example, typically our heart will beat from the top of the heart to the bottom. Our, our atrium, which is the top chamber of the heart, will send an electrical signal down to the heart. And eventually the ventricle, which is the bottom part of the pump, will eventually squeeze. So essentially like two drummers that are playing to a very natural beat, giving you a stable heart rate. Now, as you can imagine, if any of those two drummers, and since the signal is coming from the top one, the atrium, if he starts to play off beat or play too fast for any reason, then it can really throw off the bottom one. So you can understand that the two drummers are not in sync, mainly because the atrium, which is the first drummer or the first beat, doesn't work consistently or is working too fast or just not working appropriately. It can cause the second part, the ventricle, to not be able to squeeze consistently or at a regular interval. That's something that we call AFib. It is very common in cardiology. It's very common in sick patients. It's very common in older patients. And as an internal medicine doctor, you should be experienced to say that's AFib. So recognizing it, seeing it on EKG, and then kind of knowing what your algorithm is going to be of the first few medications you'll try, if the patient's stable, if they're not stable. And you're taught this throughout med school, you're taught this throughout residency. So a medicine doctor can often take care of AFib. And there's tons of diseases where there's a lot of bread and butter cardiology that a medicine doctor can do, a cardiologist can do. And often when I'm on consults or consultant services, where I'm called by a surgeon or an in-medicine doctor saying this patient has one of those bread and butter problems. Often, 
if it's a good doctor, it's because they've tried those first few things in the algorithm and it's not working. And so they need my help. But sometimes you do have medicine doctors that are busy or surgeons who are just not familiar with the algorithm anymore because it's been forever where it may be the first step. No one's taken it and they need your help to initiate it. So there's that overlap aspect. Now the parts that medicine doctor can't do that a cardiologist can is especially when the heart gets really sick. Some of the things we talked about is that if you have a blockage, a medicine doctor cannot go in there and open that stent that requires an interventionalist. So not even me at the stage, although I am in the cath lab helping with those kinds of things, but there's somebody who is specifically trained to do things like open stents, put balloons in, identify which artery is causing the most amount of blockages, thus causing the discomfort or the chest pain. There are things that we can do when the heart gets really sick and can't pump. If somebody has really bad heart failure and we can't just simply take fluid off for a variety of reasons, we can put extra devices within the area of the heart to essentially offload how it works. For example, imagine essentially having a mini vacuum near your heart so that if you have a bad pump, you can essentially just suck now blood for the heart and essentially do some of the work for it helps it unload that's a device that we call an impella or a balloon pump those are devices that we often put through patients groins and they travel all the way up near or through the heart and then we use those to essentially do some of the workload for the heart temporarily while whatever insult that the heart is having over can you know improve or we evaluate those patients for things like transplants you can imagine when those patients get really sick to that level that cannot be done by an internal medicine doctor and there's definitely a big spectrum of where somebody draws a line that it's just a cardiologist that can do that versus a medicine doctor. But usually when people get really sick, they will call me. Anybody that is in our ICUs right now usually will need me versus just a medicine doctor to do the variety of things that we are to make them more stable. So next question is something that I get a lot in the comments, which is I want to ask you about work-life balance and compensation of a cardiologist. I'm going to start the second one first because I get a lot of these questions and they're, to be honest, guys, sometimes they're like forceful as in all that the question is really trying to get to is just like, how much money are you going to make? And this is me being very honest honest, that answer is very easy to Google or search and the YouTube comments probably not the best place to get it because I don't make this channel to talk about how much I'm going to make as a cardiologist or how much money I make now as a fellow. I know that those are topics that are very attractive because you shouldn't care about money in medicine. I mean, it is an important part of which career path you may pick. If you have two career paths that you like equally, you should pick the one that pays more. It means easier lifestyle for you and your family, etc. So I understand money being important, but often I feel like sometimes the questions come across as I'm only going to pick the fields that pay well because that that's ultimately what you want. And this is way too long of a field to go in and just for the money or continue to pursue it for the highest salaries. There are cardiologists that make a ton of money, but they work a lot of hours. And I don't want to be one of those because I want to spend time with my daughter. She's six months. I want to spend time with my wife. I want to spend time with my dog and the rest of my family. So if I have to make on the lower end of what a cardiologist makes, the average, and I think I've talked about this in prior videos, is about $400,000, $450,000. If you're an interventionalist, which we talked about before, you're going to make more because you do procedures. Usually the compensation that comes with those because because you require more training is a little bit more. You may be making 500, 550, Again, that spectrum may be much higher, maybe much lower, depending on what part of the country you work with and what exactly you do. So that's the compensation answer. But the big takeaway that I want to give for the comments is try not to ask with the pressure of just feeling like that answer is going to make the decision of what you pursue. I love cardiology. I really enjoy what I learned despite having long days. I'm eating my first or second meal of the day, but that's because I've been busy about taking care of patients and really just honestly just forgot to eat. That should be a good example of that you found the right field, not because, oh, I'm glad it's going to make me X amount of hundreds of Ks or whatever it is. Second question we kind of already talked about, which is work-life balance. I think as I get older in the field of cardiology, I'll have more control of saying, you know what, my daughter is 10, 11, 13 years old, and maybe we have more kids, then they'll be X amount of years. And I want to spend more time with them when they are at that teenage fun age to truly have your role as a parent and have you know, more experiences with them, more journeys with them. And maybe I just don't want to work as much. But when my daughter is one or my daughter is seven months, maybe she doesn't really know or remember all these little things when I'm more at work versus with her. So it makes more sense for me to get in more hours or earlier. Right now and some fellowship, my schedule's already fixed. But that will change. I will likely want to have less time at work and more time with my family. And I think as I'm further and further into my journey, I will be able to say I have clearly had the expertise of being a great cardiologist, but this is the work hours that I am willing to work. That work-life balance, my hopefully, is going to increase as I work further and further into this field. Next question is very similar, which says, do cardiology attendings have
have the busiest schedule, especially interventional cardiology, EP, and heart failure. So a few terms to clear up for any of you guys that don't know what those are. Attending basically means an independent practicing provider. When I was a hospitalist, I was an attending because I was practicing myself. I could have had other people underneath me, but I was kind of like the where the buck stops. Right now, as I'm a fellow, I'm in training. And so I have an attending even when I'm in the ICU who's overseeing my decisions, where I talk about things, especially if I have questions. In fellowship, there's a lot less handholding, but they are there and available to make decisions with you, to help bounce ideas off of. But easy way to think about them is supervisors. Your attending is the head honcho. So when somebody says attending, they are attending of the service. They are the head boss supervisor of the service. IC or interventional cardiologist, we talked about that. EP is electrophysiology. These are doctors that are specialists in an arrhythmias of the heart. So if somebody comes in with something like AFib, like we've talked about, they would take care of those. But there's tons of other things. Somebody having heart block where the signal is not getting translated from the top to the bottom of the heart would be something that an EP or electrophysiology doctor would take care of. These are your doctors that place things like pacemakers, defibrillators, and other cool devices. Pretty cool, interesting field. And it's definitely very heavy on the physics-based and science-based compared to maybe some of the other things that we do in cardiology. Very cool. I probably won't want to pursue it. Definitely an interesting field. And the last one, heart failure. We talked about there are specific doctors who are specialists in heart failure, especially when you're pumped, your heart gets really weak, where you are probably a candidate for something like this person eligible to get a new heart. Or if they do get a new heart, who's going to take care of it? Those are some of the things that come in the realm of a heart failure cardiologist. Those are all the terms. Now let's talk about who has a busy schedule. They're all busy. So your lifestyle as an interventionalist can be very busy simply because when you're on call, um, it's not like you can take the call over the phone and saying, do X, Y, and Z for the patient. You are the person that comes in and places that stent to open up the heart. So that's really busy. Electrophysiology, less so, although it can be busy because there's less emergencies where you have to come in the middle of the night and just do them yourself. There are a few situations here and there, but I find that my electrophysiology colleagues and attendings are busy. They work a lot. They answer a lot of very unique questions, but often it's kind of Monday to Friday with some call here and there on the weekends. But they're still very busy. And then heart failure can be very busy. A lot of the heart failure attendings that I worked with when I was a resident and now when I'm a fellow do a lot of kind of critical care cardiology as well because the patients who are sick being evaluated for things like transplants are often the patients who are in the ICUs. And so there's a lot of overlap of these doctors taking care of them. And so they probably have some of the busiest schedules or the most dedication and focus to their patients because an interventionalist, as you can imagine, fixes the stent. It is okay for them to be like, well, let me go help all the other people with heart blockages. I'm going to have a cardiologist now take care of their vessels that are open. A heart failure doctor really takes a lot of ownership of the patients that they take care of. If they're in the ICU, in the clinics, they're taking care of them. And so that one is probably the one I feel like is the most involved where it's in, you can't just dibble your feet into how involved you are with your patients. You are all in and they're all great docs and they're all in with their patients. Probably something, again, I couldn't do because it requires a lot of your attention towards your medicine, your patients, and maybe some focus away from your family. But I think it also depends on where you work and the style of your practice. Take a quick break to get a fry. French fries with honey mustard. Super good. That brings up one random question I can think of for you guys, which is, do I get free food in the hospital? Answer is yes. There is a cafeteria where I have a badge I can scan and then I have like X amount of money, which I never reach the threshold. There's also a doctor's lounge with tons of free snacks and drinks and ice cream, which sometimes I dibble in at 2 a.m. if I'm awake. So I'm never hungry in the hospital. Okay, so now that we are done with someone's fries, I'm gonna nibble on these chocolates and get back to y'all's questions. Next we have, how do you take care of your mental well-being as you juggle fellowship, being a father and a husband? As I kind of alluded to at the start of the video, my wife and I just had our beautiful, now about to be six month old daughter. And we've definitely had an amazing experience with her, but my daughter is as old as my fellowship experience. I had her my second year, my six, excuse me, my second week a fellowship. And so it came with a lot of challenges of learning how to be a new cardiologist, new cardiology fellow, and a new dad. And then being a husband to a new mom, there's lots of the new roles that we had. We just bought a house two months before that. So being figure out how to own a home. So a lot to juggle. Running this YouTube channel, all these roles that I've chosen to, um, to take on. The question is, how do you take care of your mental well-being? It's actually not as hard as the juggling sounds because all those things that I talked about identify those as being important to me. Thus, me having those in my life make me happy. None of those roles are something that I'm taking on because I have to. I'm not taking on being a fellow because I need to do this for anyone else. I'm doing this for me. It's gonna provide benefit to my family later on through financially stability. And I'm gonna have a job that I enjoy going to. My patients ideally will benefit from a doctor who's happy from what they like to do. But me choosing to be a father, a husband, a homeowner, every other role I talked about keeps me happy. And so because I'm very specific with the roles that I take on in my life, and I don't say yes to things if I don't feel like they're gonna provide value to me. And I think my threshold for value is pretty low. I feel like I can give 
value from a lot of things. Using that insight, I feel like I'm happy. I may be busy, I may be not always getting as much sleep as I want. My mental well-being comes with the, the package that I am enjoying what I do. When I go home tomorrow at 12 and I'm tired, not knowing how much sleep I'm going to get tonight, when I see my daughter, being a dad is going to make me want to be okay with those lack of sleep so I can spend time with her. And that's how I've managed, I think, my entire medical journey, where somebody would ask me, how's it going? And my answer is usually can't complain. And I think it's because I have elected to go through every path that I have been on thus far. And I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that I've had, which is that this journey has been of my own volition and in a good way, but even some of the bad moves that I've made because I thought it would make me happy. Maybe it didn't. So all the roles that I've taken on and juggling make me happy. My wife makes me happy. My daughter makes me happy. My dog makes me happy. Being a fellow and the colleagues that I work with make me happy. And so it's not that hard to balance my mental well-being. Yeah, I think that's a good way to summarize that. So that was pretty deep. Let's go back to a more superficial question, which is what are the most common cardiology illnesses that you come across as a cardiologist? It's actually a great question. Some of them we alluded to. Bread and butter cardiology is basically what you're used to seeing very often. So you certain buckets. You deal with things like coronary artery disease, which basically is a fancy word for blockage in the heart vessels. Um, that supply the heart. You have a bucket for things like the strength of the heart failure, which we talked about already. We have a, a bucket for arrhythmias, which are things like AFib. You have a bucket for things like valvular disease, which is the muscle is fine, the heart is beating fine, but the actual doors are too leaky or too tight, as we talked about aortic stenosis. And I'm probably forgetting a few of the common buckets that we deal with, but I feel like those four or five usually can summarize the majority of the patients that I work with. And a lot of times patients will have a multitude of those. On average, how many hours of work do you complete per week? If it's a cardiology fellow, I'd probably say I'd work about 60 hours a week. I'm in the ICUs, definitely pushing that 70 plus. And then when I'm doing like an imaging rotation where I can usually come in a little bit later while the imagings are being obtained. So I'm on plan doing like stress tests and people are obtaining nuclear scans. Usually I can come in at eight and then leave by four. Those are a little bit nicer and there's no weekends. Do you see yourself pursuing an additional specialty within the field of cardiology in the future? Great question. Essentially, what do I want to do in my life? The answer is probably not. You can have a great career with a lot of variability after just doing three years of cardiology fellowship. It does require you to be proactive and finding parts within cardiology that you are going to make your niche. And I have a few ideas of places and fields and buckets that we talked about that I want to become more of an expert in over the next year. By the time I'm applying for a job in the next two years, I can say these are the areas that I feel very comfortable with taking care of patients. If none of those providers in my group really feel adept in taking care of those, those patients would come to me and then essentially you would create a practice taking care of those niches of patients. And so I don't think I, actually I know, I probably will not. 98%, 99, 97. 97 and a half percent sure. And I will not pick another subspecialty. I think I am done with the training aspect. Although I enjoy fellowship, I think another two and a half years, which is what I have left, is gonna be more than enough. Next question, as a generalist, do you know if cardiologists are able to dedicate days of the week to being in the cath lab or is it only for interventionalists? Like, are you able to schedule where you have clinic rounds in the hospital, interventional procedures all on different days? Great question. You can be a general cardiologist and do procedures. You can do things like right heart cats. Some general cardiologists do things like pacemaker placement. Some people will do things like left heart cath. That is basically looking at the major arteries, the heart and looking for blockages. They don't put stents in, but you can do those procedures. You can do other procedures like doing a transesophageal echo. Most ultrasounds of the heart are done from the chest, but if you want more information for whatever reason, a transesophageal gives you a lot extra additional information. It is a procedure that a lot of general cardiologists will essentially have half days of the week where or maybe be doing procedures in the morning, clinic in the afternoon, or a full day of clinic, or a full day of procedures, or some mixture where they may be doing consults in the hospital, and during different parts of the day, they may be going to the procedure room to do the patient's procedures, and then going back and seeing more consults. And so, yes, as a generalist, you could do some of the procedures that an interventionalist can, but not all of them. Essentially, the best way to think about it is that if there's intervention that needs to be made, that's usually where the buck stops. So you can't put a stent in, you can't open up a valve. For most of the time, it's a very diagnostic-based procedures, which honestly are kind of like where I like to draw the line anyways, so I enjoyed the flexibility that offers. Next question, how do you like your cardiology training? What are some difficulties and accomplishments while in training? I don't know if I have very many accomplishments. I'm only six months in. I feel like I'm much more comfortable than I expected to be at this phase, especially being in the ICU as a brand new first year. I feel like my comfort level is probably higher than I'm expecting, so that's good. But how have I liked it? I've absolutely loved it for a few reasons. And I talked about this in my four month recap cardiology video. Um, so I'll link that down below if you guys are interested. The people I work with are amazing. This field is very interesting. I enjoy coming to work. There's so much to learn. And then when you feel like you've learned something and you can apply it to help another patient, it feels so good, which in cardiology happens over and over again with more repetition.
repetitions, you're able to use little clues here and there, more imaging modalities, just put a better puzzle together and say, I've seen this before, I can use this to help this patient. And then with more patient experience, you can say, I've seen this before again, I can help this next patient even better. That part's why. But the training I've gotten here has been amazing, lots of hands-on, the attendings. Usually I've found that 99% of the time, think of you as a colleague that they were trying to train to be the best cardiologist versus like a trainee. And I've enjoyed not feeling like the person who just meant there to, to write the notes. Next question is how much are you expected to know at a fellow at different stages? Are you expected to be independent doing echoes before entering fellowship and other skills? The answer is absolutely not. At least where I train, you're expected to know nothing. And then you're taught things over time through repetition. I think the biggest difference for residency is that in both of them, they're expecting you to know nothing on day one. But in fellowship, you learn a lot of it just by doing and having reps. So no one was expecting me to know how to read an echo or an ultrasound of the heart. Often the way it would go is I would be in a month of my ultrasound rotation. And then somebody would say, what is that? And if I got the answer wrong, they would say, nope, actually, this is what it is. And then I would remember the, the next time. And then that perseverates down a thousand different questions about everything cardiology related. And that is how you learn cardiology as a fellow, trial and error. As a resident, there's a lot of, let me teach you about this first, and then I'll ask you questions. There's just way too much to learn, very little time. You just learn better by hands-on. And a lot of the way that our program works here, it's hands-on learning, you use your attendings if you, you are stuck, and uh, you learn through experience. But you're not expected to know anything. When I started my first day as an ICU fellow um, on the ICU, I wasn't really expected to know very much because we do one night a week in the ICU you've learned that experience throughout time that comes with reps. Next question is a little bit similar. It says, can you briefly compare your fellowship experience to your residency experience? We talked about the teaching aspect of it. To it. I feel like as a fellow, the biggest difference is that I see the finish line much differently than I see in residency. In residency, it was about getting into fellowship or finding my first job, but you don't think about five, 10 year plan. You're just trying to think about getting through training, getting through your call days, getting through your ICU rotations. And often you would be doing rotations that you would be enjoying. As a fellow, there's less of that. Everything is cardiology. So although I may not enjoy every aspect of cardiology, I enjoy the field, I enjoy the patients I work with. And so it's easy to come to work because I'm talking and learning about cardiology each and every step of the way. That part's nice. And because I know in the future, I can design a practice where I take care of those more enjoyable niches more often than the less enjoyable niches. For example, I am not an interventionalist. Don't hate me if you are interested in interventionalists or you are an interventionalist and you're watching it to this point in this episode. But I don't really care to do left heart cats or place debts. Not that there shouldn't be somebody who does. I may not enjoy my cath lab experience as much as I enjoy my echo or ICU experience, but I enjoy them a lot more than being on a GI rotation. Don't hate me if you are a GI doctor, but I just don't enjoy talking about the liver or poop or diarrhea or abdominal pain. It's not my forte. But as a resident, you would have to be experienced in that field for me as internal medicine. So that's the biggest difference is that every rotation feels like something that I will likely be doing in the future, aside from interventional or electrophysiology. And then the last few questions, have I planned out my medical school loan prepayment plan? Yep, basically the plan is set aside some money between now and then. My loans are technically zero dollars because my income is not as high as it should be given that I have a wife and kid that are dependent on the income. So to be fully frank, my loan monthly payment is zero dollars, although my loan is is about $180,000. And so the plan is to create a buffer over this next year, my first year of fellowship, my second year, the salary will go up a little bit higher and using that buffer to start paying off the loans. And then I'll be doing a lot of moonlighting here in 2024. And so using some portion of that to be paying the loan, just to get in the habit of seeing that amount go down using a little bit of an avalanche technique. So that's my overall strategy. But that guys, although while there are a few more questions, this video is now going into about 30 plus minutes. And I would like to enjoy the rest of these French fries before nurses call me, but I have only been interrupted during this video once. Um, and it's from my attending just kind of saying, let's touch base before I go to bed. I mean them trying to see if that new patient's here. But I think that that has been a successful Q&A with the life as a cardiologist. Hopefully it gave you guys some insight into what my life as a fellow looks like, how I perceive this journey. Hopefully it can be a positive experience for you guys because I have truly enjoyed these last six months. I am really excited for the next two and a half because again, I talked about this in my four month video is that I can really see how exciting it's gonna be when a year from now or a year and a half from now, how much cardiology I'm going to know, where this is going to feel more and more second nature to me. And that is pretty cool when you're, you know, thinking about a 20, 30 plus year career. So 
With all that being said, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments down below what other questions you have, what other questions. If you enjoy this style of video or I'm very raw, very limited editing and just kind of talking to the camera answering the things that you guys want to know, particularly about my life as a cardiologist, let me know. Because if so, it's very easy and enjoyable for me to make these kinds of videos for you guys. As a kind of a last aside, if you somehow made it to the end of this video and you want to succeed on your medical journey, you essentially would want all of the things that I wish I did, as well as the things that I didn't do on a medical journey, how I would have studied differently, how I would have been more productive, how I manage my time, how I study for boards. My team and I here at the MD Journey have decided to put all the things that we've ever created in one place called the Med School Blueprint. And I'll link that down below. If you guys want to see the reviews that people have gone through that program, you can see it down below. And if you're interested, definitely consider signing up. If you're not, no hard feelings. And if you are somebody who needs some one-on-one -on -one help, I'll link that down below. We do have a coaching program if you guys are interested. But most importantly, if you did enjoy this video, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit that notification bell to be notified when new videos like this go out live. And as always, my friends, hopefully this was a little helpful to you on your medical journey. And as always, thank you for joining me on mine. I'm going to enjoy my Dr. Pepper and my French fries. And fingers crossed, pray for me that I get some sleep, please. Peace.